Have you ever wondered what we should be doing during Lent and what things can we give up beyond just food in order to walk that path with Jesus? That's what we'll talk about today. As Lent is a time for greater love, listen to Jesus' thirst. Repent and believe. Jesus tells us, what are we to repent? Our indifference, our hardness of heart. What are we to believe? Jesus thirsts even now in your heart, in the poor. He knows your weakness. He wants only your love. He wants only the chance to love you. Mother Teresa. Today we're going to talk about the book, 40 Days of Decrease. A Different Kind of Hunger, A Different Kind of Fast, by Alicia Britt Choll. I never really do anything for Lent. I guess probably because it's just not something that I was raised doing. Obviously, I was a Christian later in life, and I never followed any sort of a practice for Lent. And when I saw this book, I thought it looked interesting to me because it gives some different ideas about what you can do for Lent instead of, you know, maybe giving up meat or giving up other things that you may enjoy in the sense of having a sacrifice. The point is giving up something that's dear to you so that you know a cost. And when Jesus and the idea of Lent, you know, was tested in the Bible, he went hungry. He was tempted by the devil. And so we walk that path with him so we can feel at least a little bit and somewhat symbolically, that thirst and that hunger. But this book is interesting. I wanted to think about a different practice, and this book was exactly that. I did worry that it was going to make you give up foolish things, and so I thought maybe this book wasn't really for me. But this is a serious book, and what she has you give up in these 40 days of Lent towards Easter is pretty deep and satisfying and meaningful. And that's where we're going to talk about this book. She had a difficult situation in her life where she had a health crisis and she was bedridden. She was exhausted. She felt terrible. And in this time of basically fasting everything in her life because she was sick, she learned a lot. She grew in that connection with God. She says, quote, found Jesus there. And her point is that she said, we often think of Jesus starting his fast when he stepped into the wilderness. But she says that she believes it happened much earlier than that, because Jesus didn't only just give up food and water when he went into the desert. He gave up his God powers from the time he was born. He had to watch his parents go through perilous times. He had to watch John die. He had to watch people around him sick, where he couldn't give the power he had to other people. And that was really what he gave up the most from his time on earth. This ability to know that you can create miracles in people's lives, and yet you can't at that moment. She says he had to watch his mother being whispered about in town because how did she get pregnant before she was married? And he had to watch his apostles go through tough times. She says, quote, Perhaps we should be likewise grateful, awed, and humbled by his 30-year fast from praise, power, and potential in Nazareth. She discusses how we like to be self-reliant, I know, particularly in the United States. That's our big thing. But what we're called to do is be reliant on God. And so much of what she talks about in this book and what she learned by being very ill is how to be more reliant on God. And that he walked into the desert and fulfilled his purpose there. He came out with a clear, uncompromised calling. She says he lived an uncluttered life focused on what his death would bring to the world. And so she said that the 40 days in Lent, both in Catholic and Protestant tradition, is that giving something up. 
What she does in her book is she has readings, she has scripture passages, and she has them at a six-day week, beginning on Ash Wednesday. So I'm a little late with this podcast, and I'm a little late for me too. So next year is when I'm going to focus on what she's talking about and try this out. And I've tried some of the things that she talked about through this Lenten time individually. But next year, I hope to do it in the exact 40-day pattern. She hopes that this whole experience brings us closer to God and make us crave the connection with him so that we not just go through this Lenten time, which is so easy to do, and then get to Easter, but to experience the deprivation of self and the closeness of God. So her first fast is to stop thinking about Lent as a project. So here's where I got kind of messed up in the book. Everything she says is, quote, today's fast, Lent as a project, meaning that you should give up the idea of Lent as a project, not that you should turn Lent into a project. And I get what she means with this first one. I know that a lot of people do things for Lent and they give something up and it almost seems like a challenge. Can I do this? Can I give up desserts for the 40 days? Can I give up meat? Can I stop swearing or stop doing this or that. And I'm not disparaging anyone who gives something up for Lent. I believe that their intentions are heartfelt and exactly in the right place. But she calls us or asks us to be awed by this experience of walking in a tradition of Jesus instead of looking at it as something to accomplish. And I think that's such a great point. She says that we often talk about it in terms of a project, you know, whether we we did all right, or we made it, or yay, it's two more weeks, you know, and so we keep a schedule and we go through it. And she says to stop thinking of it about that and instead dwell in this sharing of something with Jesus. She says that we should look at it more like a journey and a place that we're staying. It's not productivity. It's about that deep dive into the next 40 days. And to think even about the disciples who went through really horrible times. As I mentioned before, you know, people were thinking they were about to achieve success. Jesus was going to go triumphantly into Jerusalem and be the Lord. And what happened? He died. He was crucified. They fled. They became weak. Peter denied Christ. People were in hiding. And you could understand that they were sad and miserable and everything that you can be when you think the one person you relied on let you down and also is gone for good. And so their situation, their lack of belief led them into a lot of pain when instead it's Easter, she said, that brings us to celebration. We know how the story ends and we can look at Peter and wonder how he could deny Christ after just being with him all that time. But you know what? Again, we know the end of the story. We know how this goes. If this was us and we put everything on the line, our families, our businesses, our time, in Peter's case, with his wife, everything was on the line and it was now gone. So you have to walk into that time. And so think about that too, that in this time of Lent, not just the suffering that Jesus goes through, but the suffering of the people around him when they thought he was gone. Someone mentioned once about Judas, too, you know, that they thought Judas goes one of two ways, that, G- that Judas betrayed Jesus, you know, for the coin. Some people suggested, too, that if Judas really believed in Jesus, he thought, well, God would never allow himself be arrested or crucified. So it was going to work out fine. Because all these bad things are not going to happen. You're not going to take down God. You're not going to take down the Messiah. And so maybe even he didn't believe that what he was doing was so bad because Jesus will figure a way out of it. So this whole idea of Jesus dying on the cross meant different things to different apostles. Think, too, about his family. He had brothers in the list of apostles. He had Mary Magdalene who was personally saved by him in very deep and meaningful ways. So 
everyone had this different experience of loss when it came to Jesus. She says for day two, we should get rid of our regrets. We should stop looking at the past. We should start thinking about this new self, this new life in Jesus. This time of Easter is to give up on all those regrets because, again, the apostles probably had a lot of them watching Jesus die, the things that they gave up for him. And then when Jesus comes back, those regrets are gone. And so, again, since we know the end of the story, our regrets should be gone too. This is a time for hope, for dreams. And all the hurts that we have in the past can go. For day three, she talks about Corey Ten Boom, who gave glory to God. And so what we're going to do is fast from gathering praise for ourselves and think about praising Jesus. That's where it matters the most. So this book gets very interesting in how she chooses these items. And again, this is why I'm going to do it next year, because I really want to follow this full path, even if I'm going to do some of the things this year. But her fourth day is artificial light. She wants us to turn out artificial light. Now we just got serious. You know how much artificial light I have? I mean, it's still practically winter here. It gets dark early. Living a day without artificial light is hard. For me, at least, I'm a nerd. But to have that time And to live a day by candlelight. There's so many times in the Bible, this made me think of this, that we have uncertainty. And I think we live in a very certain time because we have this power in our house. We turn on the lights. We turn on the heat. Everything is right here for us. And when you think about all the passages in the Bible that talk about light and dark, I think it's hard for us. Like the story where it talks about you would never put a lantern under a bushel. Light was so expensive at the time of the Bible. You may work months to get hours of light. So that passage about putting light under a bushel means that you would never waste such a gift. And I think that's what she's trying to bring us back again, that we put so much certainty by relying on this light, this artificial light, we could do with a night where we don't have it. She goes on to suggest in other days that we should give up doubt, but not our questions. God always answers our questions. He didn't mind questions. He didn't mind taking questions from people. So she asks us to give up uncertainty, but making sure that it's uncertainty followed by questions, by gaining truth from God and having our questions answered. One day she asked us to give up just getting past sorrow. Boy, that's my number one thing right there. If I'm feeling sorrow and I'm feeling sadness, I do every trick I have in the book, get over it. I don't like it. I don't find it productive. And so I do what I can to get past it. When Jesus found out that John was beheaded, he allowed himself to have grief. He allowed himself to sit in that sadness. And if Jesus can experience sadness, why do we think we can just get past it and not ponder it, allow it to take us in, allow it to show us meaning? Some days she has us fast from an actual meal because it's important for us to also feel that time of deprivation. Fasts are popular in the Bible. There's many different kinds of fasts, and many people do fasting in general. But for religious purposes and for biblical purposes, it's about removing something that is comforting to us so that we can feel this sense of denial. One day she even suggests we get over fixing it. Another big one for me. I'm a fixing person. I have two podcasts that talk about how to fix things. And she says, you know what? It's God that calms the storms. And it's not about us fixing things. It's about God calming our storms and fixing those things that are rocking us in our lives. So we're going to give up for a day trying to fix things. 
and put it in the hands of God. One day she has us avoiding avoidance. We talk about, again, trying to get past bad things. We don't like to look at the face of um, hardship in our lives, you know, like ads where people are suffering and need our help or people on the street who need our help. So it's time to get over avoiding the painful things in life and even the painful things in our own life and stop avoiding the thing we know we need to do. She says that we should ask God's Holy Spirit to sensitize us to the existence of avoidance in our own life. It's such a great point. One day she has us talking about not profiling people, right? We love to put people in buckets. We talked a lot about that when we were looking at C.S. Lewis, the screw tape letters. One of the things the demons try to do is to get us to bucket people. Oh, look at those young people, or look at those rich people, or look at the poor people. You know, whatever it is that we do to put people into buckets, Jesus never looked at us in a bucket. So giving that up for a day and focusing on avoiding that will be such a powerful exercise for us for the whole year. She says one day we should give up on isolation. Go be with a friend. Go be with other people. You know, I guess that ever since I started working from home and didn't have to go into the office, I mean, there still is an office, but I get so much more work done here. But I'm very isolated. Maybe for this exercise, I could go back into the office and just be with people again. God intends us to be in relationships with each other and not isolated. One of the interesting things that she has us giving up is stinginess. And I know that a lot of the people who are a member of my church and who are my friends and family look at being frugal with money and responsible with money as being a very good thing. And it is. It is a blessing for us to do. But there's that passage where the woman washed the feet of Jesus in perfume. And then, of course, in Mark 14, 4 through 5, that's like a year's worth of salary. What is she doing? And they rebuked her for it. And we hate waste. And it's a good, solid attribute to not waste things. But at times, our stinginess leaves us away from honoring God. How can we do better by honoring God and not be stingy or not hold back the wealth that we have been given in our lives. It's such a great point. She talks about giving up apathy, denial, intimidation. We get intimidated to shut up because of the people in the world around us. We don't want to get avoided, canceled, but we are given to having a bold spirit in Jesus. So by giving up intimidation, we can gain strength and boldness in our faith. She talks about how Jesus met with Pilate, very powerful guy, and he tried to intimidate Jesus in many different ways. And you know what? Jesus wasn't having any of it. We can have that boldness too. She says that we should give up addition, which means maybe some of the luxuries in our daily needs. We think that we have a lot of things that we need in our life. You know what? Jesus didn't need for much. And yet he was focused on everything. And so in honor of Jesus, she says that we should try to go without things that are unnecessary to our faith, adding to our life more with other things. Spend a day without adding more. She calls it partially escapism, that sometimes we buy ourselves things, we do extra things because we're trying to escape from some realities in our lives. And so by giving up on the addition, we will see our lives in a more realistic sense. This was interesting. She said that she thinks we should give up guarding tombs. And that means focusing on all the negative, spending so much time in our past that we're guarding the tomb of Jesus, even though nobody's in there anymore, that we are new And that our newness is here, brought to us by God. And so we shouldn't let the past, the tombs that are around us, bring us down. Because now is a time for renewal. That's what Easter is all about. So this gives you just a taste of what the book is like. It was so thoughtful. 
And the things that she has us give up during the 40 days of Lent are so meaningful. I don't know why. I was somewhat prepared to think that this was going to be light, you know, that this was going to be give up this for a day and give up that for a day and give up your car for a day is so much deeper than that and is so much more meaningful. And when you read the words and the passages that she includes, it's very valuable. So I really recommend this book. I think that, again, we missed Lent this year for this book. I wish I would have done a podcast about it before Lent, but unfortunately, I found it halfway through Lent. So my challenge to you is think about something that you could really use a fast from, something that you're doing that is holding you back from this relationship, from this communion with God, and see, in the short term, could you give up some of these things that are bringing you that separation and see how it works for you? Maybe next year you'll want to try out this book. All right, everyone, thanks so much. Appreciate you listening. Please remember to tell a friend about the podcast. Again, we're trying to grow the podcast. And if you have great ideas in the spirit of this book about what you could give up for Lent, you can email me or you can find me on Twitter. All the links are on my website, smallstepswithgod.com. And I look forward to hearing what things were meaningful to you. And remember, our fast in the desert can bring us closer to God and give us the purpose we need in order to fulfill the life that Jesus wanted from us and for us to fulfill the mission God set before us. Have a wonderful week.